Hey, before I uh, continue sharing, we've been sharing, if you're joining us today, um, just to let you know uh, that I'm going to be talking, we've been uh, talking for about four weeks now, we're wrapping it up today, we've been talking about uh, generosity, giving, uh, we looked at uh, the issue of tithing in church and so on. As soon as I say that word, some of you might switch off or suddenly get, have the need to go and answer a, car, a phone in the car or something. Please don't. Uh, uh, bear with us. Listen. Um, we don't talk a lot about finances in church for the very simple reason that um, people in Australia have this idea that the church is what? It's just after your money, so we generally don't talk a lot. We don't pass plates and buckets around those that... Uh, call this place home, they know where, where tithes and offerings and whatever you want to call it goes, they know that. But we've been talking about that and getting back into these ancient documents and looking at what these documents say about the whole area of the tithe, but more specifically about giving in general in the New Testament. Uh, now, I just want to say this, um, as I mentioned, we don't talk a lot about this and one of the reasons why I don't like talking about this is because I've been a part of, I guess, movements where it's talked about every seven days and it almost becomes overkill when it comes to money. So this is actually the third time in the seven years of Arise we've talked about it. So I'm, I'm happy with those statistics. That's not too bad. Uh, but again, we make no apologies for it. It's an important part of our life. But what I do want to say is this. Um, I, I've had more feedback, positive feedback. I shouldn't say feedback. I get feedback all the time. I've had more positive feedback uh, about this series and, and, and talking about giving and finances than what we've ever had. So praise God, it's, it's scratching where some people are itching and so on. And I'm also hearing some wonderful testimonies from people about uh, stuff that God's doing in your world uh, as well in this area. And I want to get some, uh, uh, somebody up this morning to share, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming up and just share with us a testimony. Uh, whenever I hear uh, uh, great testimonies, I love to get them to be shared because there's something powerful about somebody's testimony, their journey, uh, and hopefully that uh, encourages you as much as it encouraged me. Hallelujah, church. How are you going? Um, if you don't know me, I'm Matt, and I've got a, a very lovely, long-suffering wife by the name of A, so we'll, you'll get to meet us one day. Uh, Al was just talking about unmerited favour, unmerited grace, you know, so um, I want to tell you that God does have a plan and a purpose for your life. He cares about you dearly, and he cares about your life and your family, and he cares about your finances, and so I've got a wonderful testimony that um, happened last weekend. Um, the Lord had laid upon our hearts to, uh, to bless a family with some, some goods. Uh, so uh, through a little bit of an organisation, we, we, we organised it. Uh, we went and picked it up on Saturday morning and paid for it and dropped it off to them and went home. Uh, that afternoon... Um, if, if you don't, we live at Woodburn, we got smashed by the floods and I was uh, looking for another mower for the, for the farm, another small mower and so Saturday afternoon we went out to look at another mower and I'd haggled the bloke down a few hundred bucks and I thought I was doing pretty good at that and I was feeling, yeah, that's okay. But by the time I'd got home, the gentleman had sent me a text message to take another... A 25% discount off the, the price of the mower, which was pretty much the same as what we'd sowed the seed into the goods for this couple. So I just want to, I've never had something happen that quick. Like God says, you give seed to the sower. You know, so, so just believe that he's given you seed and if he puts in something on your heart, step out, trust God. The harvest will come. Awesome, thanks, and thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, something about testimonies, uh, whenever you hear a testimony, it's God in human form actioning something through a human being, and sometimes that can speak so much louder than somebody just reading words off a page. So uh, thank you for sharing that with us, that's awesome. God is at work, God can be trusted, who believes that we can trust God? Yeah, we can trust God with every area of our world, uh, not just the supposed spiritual areas, you know, we trust God, prayer and Bible reading, and all, but, but God's interested in everything, isn't he? He's interested in, in the whole of our existence and he's interested in the whole of life. And so anyway, we've been talking for the last few weeks about uh, giving and uh, money and uh, so on. Uh, we started off by looking at uh, tithing 
And uh, if you want to catch up on some of this, you can go onto our YouTube uh, channel and watch it. We talked about the tithe and we looked at tithing in the Old Testament. And uh, in a nutshell, as the kids say, um, tithing, the first tithe was given outside the context of law. Uh, tithing was given hundreds of years before the law was ever brought into place. So when people say, well, we don't tithe anymore because it's under the law and the law is gone, well, that's not true uh, because tithing was first uh, introduced outside of the law. Therefore, you can take the law away. Then technically, it hasn't really taken the concept of tithing away. Having said that, having said that, why did Abraham give what we call a tithe, 10%? Well, biblically, we have no idea why he chose 10%. And so we've been looking at what, is the, what do these ancient writers tell us that we can kind of put together to give us a bit of a framework for giving if we then jump all the way over the Old Testament and we jump into the New. And so we've been looking at the New Testament and does the New Testament have any evidence that correlates to the way that that first tithe back in Genesis was given? And there were three points that we drew out of that first time when Abraham gave his tithe. And the first one was that Abraham gave voluntarily. He was not forced to do it. It was not a legal requirement. 2022 today, let me just take the pressure off you. It is not a legal requirement and you are not forced to have to give a a 10% or whatever. It's not a legal requirement. It wasn't for Abraham and it's still not a legal requirement. So don't sit there thinking when you hear the word tithe, oh, they're going to say if I don't tithe, I'm cursed. No, we're not saying any of that because tithing was before the law. It was instigated outside the law. The concept continues after the law was removed. By the way, when we say that the law has been taken out of the way. How many of you know you still can't murder, you still can't cheat? Yep, exactly, that's right. So it's funny how we talk with this law grace mentality. There's a a lot more to it than just black and whites. But um, the point is that that Abraham gave 10%, but it was not a legal requirement. So our giving in 2022 should be voluntary. It's a choice. Second thing we looked at is that we know that Abraham's giving was also systematic. What was his system? Well, that's what the tithe was. It was 10%. He gave, he had systematic giving. He decided 10%. And we've had a bit of a look at, well, why was it systematic? If we go to the New Testament, is there evidence of New Testament giving being systematic? And there is. If you uh, uh, read uh, some of the letters of Paul, I don't want to cover all that ground again, but we see again in the New Testament, yes, there is evidence that giving was not only voluntary, but that in the New Testament, giving is systematic as well. What's the beauty of, of, of 10%? Well, forget whether it's 10 or 5 or 20, 50, but the beautiful thing about a percentage is this. It means that everybody has the opportunity to be a part of the blessing of giving, amen? If it was a set amount, some of us would struggle and some of us would feel like we were getting off pretty cheaply because we earn a million bucks a week. When I say we, I don't mean me. I'm not, but you know what I'm saying? When it's a percentage, it's kind of like equal sacrifice on behalf of everybody. And maybe that's why Abraham uh, gave a tithe. We don't know. What we do know, though, is that the Holy Spirit wanted that recorded in this collection of ancient documents of all the things, of all the things that took place in the history of mankind that God has done through all the different people that God has used. We have this stuff in here for a reason. Amen. There's reasons why the Holy Spirit wanted certain things recorded and to be passed down throughout the generations until Jesus comes. And so whatever it says in this book, uh, this collection of ancient documents, let me encourage you, even if it's difficult, even if you don't understand it, don't just put a marker through it and disregard it because even though I might not understand it, I know it's saying something. And I know it's there for a reason, so I wrestle a little bit with it. And that's what we've kind of been doing with tithing. So we've covered uh, 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 tithing as a volunt- being voluntary, giving as being voluntary. We've covered being systematic. I want to move on to the last one this evening, this morning, sorry. And I want to talk about our giving being uh, uh, grateful. Abraham gave his first tithe, that first record we have of him giving, he gave out of gratefulness. Um, And I was thinking this week about the story of the 10 lepers. Who knows the story of the 10 lepers in Luke chapter 17? There's a story of 10 lepers, and uh, it goes like this, in Luke 17, verse 11 to 19. It says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he was going into a village... Ten men who had leprosy met him. Now, we don't know whether that was literally leprosy. That word leprosy was used for many different kinds of skin conditions. But we do know that these guys had a problem. There was something wrong with their body that wasn't normal. It says, they stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice. And here's what they said, Jesus, master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. In other words, he told them, go and do something. 
Now, what would you have done in that situation? I wonder how many of us would have stood there and gone, no, Jesus, you didn't hear me. I'm asking you to do something for me. Here I am. Have pity on me. And Jesus says, yeah, well, go to the priest. Hang on a second, Jesus. I've still got leprosy. Nothing's changed. I don't think you heard me, Jesus. Or don't you love me, Jesus? Help me right now. But Jesus says, go and do something. Isn't it amazing how quite often that that blessing is linked to obedience, isn't it? We just Sometimes we just want God to bless us. We just go, God, here I am. Just bless me because I'm awesome. You know, I love how we talk about the fact that God loves us in 2022. We talk about it and we read about it and so on. What we need to understand though is it can go a little far, can't it? And it can get to the point where me as a mere human, I become the centerpiece of the story and God exists to serve me. I don't ever see anywhere in this collection of ancient documents where we should lose sight of the fact that even though God might be my mate here in Australian culture and God might be my friend and we might read books about how God is your boyfriend or God is your girlfriend or God is whatever, God is still God with a big G, amen? He's still God. He's still the creator of the universe. He still exists with a brain way beyond mine, emotions way beyond mine. God is still God. And don't ever, don't ever get to that point where we talk so much about the love of God that we put ourselves so central that God becomes subservient to us and we become the center piece of the story. I hate to break it to you, but in about 100 years, none of you are going to be here. Did you know that? In a hundred years, none of you are going to be here. Some of you are amening that thought. Uh, but here's the thing. In a hundred years, you won't be here. I won't be here. I hate to break this to you too, but a hundred years ago, guess what? You weren't here. You weren't here. And guess what? God was doing things a hundred years ago without your permission. Isn't that amazing? God was doing things on planet Earth before you ever showed up on the scene. And guess what? He was winning. He was doing a good job. He was winning. Because he's got this time frame of human history and he's heading in a direction and nothing you or I are going to do is going to stop that. But when we turn up on the scene, we get this drop in the bucket called human existence, this 70, 80, 100 years. We get this tiny drop in the bucket where God says, okay, do you want to partner with me and make a difference? Do you want to come on a journey with me and let's see what we can do together to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth and we get the decision, the free will choice to say, yes, I'd love to be a part of that or no, thank you. That, 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 that's the way it works. And so God is God and we're not. And so I wonder if we were there and Jesus said, well, hang on, I want you to go and walk off to the priests while you're still covered in leprosy. Would we have turned around and walked off to the priests? And if we did, would we be whinging the whole way? This Jesus character, what does he know? Look, 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 show me your hands. Look at that. But it says that they must have done what Jesus said. Because it says this. It says, and as they went, they were cleansed. Isn't that amazing? As they went, not as they stood still and did nothing. And here's a principle that I see in this collection of ancient documents, pretty much from the book of maps or the index at the start, right through to the end of the concordance in the back of your Bible, is that when we, if we want to be blessed the way that God talks about blessing, and don't read blessing as a thousand cars and a billion dollars, no, no. If that's what you think of when you hear the word blessing, then I'm going to suggest you have a problem with money. If all you think about when it comes to the blessing of God is money, then you probably have some Issues you need to deal with with finance because blessing is way beyond that. It includes that. Yes, I believe that, but it's way bigger than that. I would rather go through the difficulties of life with peace in my heart than a million dollars in my bank account and be unpeaceful. Amen? Blessing of God is way more than just material things, but I do believe biblically, and I can't escape the reality, that it does include that side of life as well. And we've just heard an amazing testimony of God coming through and proving that to a family, and through that testimony, hopefully encouraging a bunch of us here in this room as well. But it says that as they went, and here's what I see in this collection of ancient documents, that, that obedience generally precedes blessing. God speaks to us, God reveals something to us, we do what he asks of us, we do what he's saying, and then blessing comes. But many of us, we would, if we were there, we would have stood still. We wouldn't have gone, we would have stood still and gone, well, Jesus, hang on, you bless me first. Remember we went back and we looked in Genesis at the difference between the first tithe and the second. First one was Abraham. What did Abraham do? Abraham came back from battle, and it says that, God, you, 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 because God had blessed me and I overcome my enemies and I won this battle, then it says, then he gave God a tenth. 
This is Abraham acknowledging the blessing on his life and giving out of a grateful heart. But the second tithe was Jacob, wasn't it? Jacob stood his ground and Jacob said, well, here's the deal, God. If you do this for me, and then you do that for me, and then you do this for me, I think it's Genesis 25, somewhere there, and then you do that for me, and then if you if, 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 then I'll give you a tithe. In other words, God, there's more that you've got to do first before I become a grateful and generous person. And I'm just going to dig my heels in here and stand here until you do. And I wonder if Jacob was one of these lepers, would he have just maybe stood there? But thankfully, we know in the story that they didn't. All 10 of the lepers, what did they do? They did what Jesus said, and they were blessed. They were healed. It says, and as they went, they were cleansed. But watch this. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. This is not even a guy that's, that's in covenant relationship with God. But he knows a blessing when he sees one. He came and he fell down and he thanks Jesus. And Jesus says, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Has no one else returned to give? So here's one of the things I know about gratefulness. Uh, grateful people are generous people. Amen. Generous with their praise. Here's a, here's a man who recognized the blessing of God in his life. And the first thing he did when he recognized the blessing of God in his life is he returned to God and he gave praise back to God. I wonder how many of us in this room, when God blesses us or when God does uh, uh, good things in our world, we know, first of all, do we have eyes to see the goodness of God in our own life? It says that when, when this guy saw it, so these guys are all standing there, Jesus says, go, they all start walking across and heading towards the priest, and it says that when one of the guys recognized, it says when he saw them go, uh, when he saw that he was healed, it says. It says when he saw he was healed, soon as soon as he recognized the blessing of God in his life, he turned and he gave praise back to God. As soon as he recognized it. Why did the other nine not come back? Maybe it wasn't enough. Maybe it wasn't enough. Maybe they didn't recognize. Maybe they're walking along just going, well, whatever. <laughs> we don't even know whether they went to see the priest. We don't know. All we know is what happened to one man. And that was one man obeyed God, was blessed, was healed, and the minute he saw it, it says he turns and he gave back to God. See, normally the way that the kingdom of God works is this, that blessings follow obedience. Is that right? Blessing follows obedience. Now, we don't make rules out of this kind of stuff because how many of you know that sometimes God works outside the norm, doesn't he? God does things outside the norm. So I'm not standing here saying that, that, that you don't know people and I don't know people who have not been obedient, yet God is blessed anyway, or it appears that they've been blessed. I can't work it all out. I'm not God. I'm approaching a divine being from a finite pea brain perspective. And trying to work him out. I think that's why he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. So don't get too hung up on it. You're never going to fully understand God. We're not called to understand God. We're called to trust God. We're called to have faith in God. We're called to walk with God. We're called to do the best that we can down here with the knowledge and understanding that we have and to live our life to the glory of God and not just for the accumulation of stuff and things and building our own personal kingdoms. So it's normally even the kingdom that blessing follows obedience. So... It's also normative too in the kingdom of God that not only does blessing follow obedience, but it also seems normative to me that, that, that giving back to God uh, praise or glory or whatever should be following the blessing as well. That when God does something in our world that we should be giving back to God as well. It says when one of them, only one of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back and praised God. When he recognized the blessing on his life, then gratefulness caused him to do something and he gave back praise to God. So it's normative that blessing follows obedience. It's also normative that gratefulness follows blessing. Gratefulness follows blessing. When we understand that God has blessed us, that, great, that, 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 that gratefulness follows the blessing of God. Genesis 14, 20, the first time Abraham gave his tithe. It says, And praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. And the first thing Abraham does is that he gives a tenth of everything out of a grateful heart for what God had done for him. Grateful people are givers. And I'm not just talking money. Grateful people are generous. In fact, it's very hard to be a generous person if you're not a grateful person. If you don't cultivate gratefulness in your heart for the life you have and the blessings in your world, you will struggle to ever be a truly generous person. Whether that be with your material possessions, whether it be with your finance, whether it be with your time, whether it be with your praise, generous in praise to others, whether it be encouragement. If you're not grateful, you'll struggle to become a generous 
person. And see, gratitude starts by recognising what you have where you are right now. It starts by recognising what you have right now. I read a story recently about some people in a, a nursing home in Florida and this group of residents, they got together and they were discussing the ailments in their life. You know, anyone getting old in this room and recognising there are certain ailments and things that come, you know, uh, yeah, a couple of people are going, yeah, some of you can't, some of you can't raise your hand. It's just that, oh, I'd love to, Alan, but I can't because shoulder's going to pop or whatever. Anyway, these people got together in this nursing home and they're talking about uh, uh, the ailments they've got. And one guy goes, my arms are so weak, I can hardly lift this cup of coffee. <laughs> Sounded pretty close to home. So yeah, yeah. Another one says, yes, I know, my cataracts are so bad, I can't even see my coffee. <laughs> Another one says, I can't turn my head because of the arthritis in my neck. Another one says, my blood pressure pills make me dizzy. Another one says, well, I guess that's just the price we pay for getting old, amen? Everyone agreed except one woman sitting in the corner. She said, well, it's not all that bad. Thank God we can all still drive. (laughs) Know what you've got. Be grateful for the blessings in your life, amen? And if you're in that physical condition, please hand your license in. Well, that was a joke, all right? Okay, so Jacob says to God, if you bless me, then I'll be generous and I'll give. Abraham says, because you've blessed me. Where are you this morning? Are you sitting back going, God, I'm just waiting for more. I'm waiting for you to do something else before I'll cultivate a heart of generosity in my world. Or are you able to look at your life now and go, you know what, God, you've been pretty good to me. God, you've been pretty good to me, Lord. I'm a pretty blessed person. Amen? I'm a pretty blessed person person. You know, they did a, a study some years back of uh, medalists, and you probably read this at the Olympic Games. And um, can you imagine just making an Olympic Games? Can, can, are there any athletes in the room besides myself? <laughs> ben Luke, you're up the back there. How awesome would it be to make the Olympic Games? I mean, just being there, wouldn't it just be a thrill to be there? But they did a study on people that stood up on the podium to get their medals, the gold medal, uh, and, and they studied the silver medalist and the bronze medalist. And here's what they found. They found that, generally speaking, bronze medalists were way, way more grateful than the silver medalist. Isn't that weird? I mean, last time I checked, a silver medal is better than a bronze, but they found in their research that bronze medalists were way more grateful and happier than the silver medalists were. And when they did some research into that, they found out this is why. Because when a silver medalist stands on that podium, all he's thinking about is what he didn't get. He's looking at the guy in the gold thinking, you... I want your medal. And he's standing there with a silver medal, but he's too busy looking at what he doesn't have, and because of that, they're not happy, they're not grateful. But the bronze medalist, he's standing there on the podium looking at that medal going, boy, I nearly missed out on this. All I had to do was come forth. I could, aren't I lucky? Aren't I blessed? I've got this medal. There were 50 people in my event, and 47 of them aren't here. Aren't I lucky? Aren't I blessed? And they were grateful and joyful about that. But the silver medalists, too busy worrying about what they didn't have. And how many of us can be like that in our own world? How many of us are more like the bronze medalists? We're just looking going, you know what? My life could be so much worse than what it is. I mean, I look at where I came from and the opportunities that I had as a child. And I look at the the, the encouragement, what was around me and so on. But I look at my life now, married to this gorgeous, beautiful woman, four fantastic kids, I didn't say perfect, I said fantastic, that's the parent speaking. Um, Yeah, I'm surrounded by you wonderful people, we're a part of a great gathering of believers. Um, I I wake up each day knowing that whether it's an upper or a downer, Jesus is up and down and with me, he's in my world, I've got the Holy Spirit inside of me, I've got purpose, I've got direction, I've got a reason to be here. I know that one day, when this beautiful physical specimen of a body falls off the perch, that I'm going to go and be in a way better place than anything down here could ever give me. I mean, I am blessed. I'm blessed. I'm that bronze medalist going, it could be a lot worse. But how many of us are the silver medalist? How many of us are the silver medalist? We're still thinking, I I don't have and I don't have and I don't have. And if I could just... Hey, if you want to be a grateful person, start to acknowledge the blessings in your life right now and learn to be grateful for what God has already done. Because it's hard to become generous when you live like Jacob. God, if you, if you would, if you would. It's hard to become a generous person when you're always waiting like Jacob. God, you've got to do, got to do, got to do. Live like Abraham who said, God, because you have. Because you have, God, I'm going to be generous and I'm going to give and I'm going to be grateful. Abraham lived in the moment. 
And Jacob was always living for some fixed point down the track. There was a, an American political commentator by the name of Tony Snow. He passed away uh, some years back, I think in 2008, of cancer. He was addressing a bunch of students, graduating students at a Catholic university. And he said this, he said, wherever you are, whatever you do, never forget at this moment and every moment forward, you have a precious blessing. You've got the breath of life. No matter how lousy things may seem, you've got the breath of life. And while God doesn't promise tomorrow, he does promise eternity. Now, hands up if this morning you woke up and you had the breath of life in this place. Wow, there's a lot of you that are struggling to get a grip on that one. Hey? That's a simple one. Hey? I'm going to make a really wild, bold assumption and assume that every one of you woke up this morning and took a first breath. Would I be right in saying that? Yes, exactly. Nobody saw their name in the obituary section this morning of the paper. So you're having a good day. It's a good day. God's good. You're here. Be blessed. Now think about the funniest thing you've ever seen or heard. Anyone ever have that, that movie that, you know, we, 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 anyone like the movie Dumb and Dumber? Favourite movie of all time, Dumb and Dumber. Funniest movie ever. And me and my wife used to have this thing when we met new people, we'd invite you to our house. And if, if we've done this to you, I, I'm, we're still friends, so it must have worked. Anyway, we used to invite people to our house and say, here's what we're going to do, Jackie, before we get to know them. We're going to sit down and watch Dumb and Dumber with them. While they're watching Dumb and Dumber, we're watching you to see whether we can be friends or not. Because if you don't laugh at that movie, it's not going to work. It's going to be very short-term, people, I'm telling you. So anyway, think about that moment, that first time you heard the funniest gag you ever heard or saw the funniest film you ever saw. You know what's amazing about something funny? Is that you don't sit there and go, wow, my goodness, that was so funny. I think I'll throw in a belly chuckle. No, no, no. It just happens, doesn't it? You don't think about it. It just comes out of you in that moment. Well, I think, I think, I think that gratitude, I think that, that generosity is like that when gratitude is a part of our world. We just be generous. We just become generous people. It's not something that we necessarily do. It's something that just begins to flow out of us as human beings. We begin to be generous. This is the power of gratefulness. It draws generosity out of us and gratefulness releases generosity through us. We give praise to God when we recognize the good things that he does for us. Amen? We give thanks to people when we recognize the good things they've done for us. Yeah? We give applause when we recognize a great performance. You've been to the concert or the show or you've watched the Roosters play. We give applause. And we give when we're living a life of gratitude. It's just part of what happens when we're grateful. You'll be as giving a person as you are a grateful person. And I say that in all areas of life. You will be as giving a person as you are a grateful person. But here's the thing. You can lose your sense of gratefulness, can't you? We can lose our sense of gratefulness. We lose our sense of gratefulness when we allow the blessings in our life to become normalized. Now think about that for a second. When you allow the blessings in your life to become normalized, you'll lose that sense of gratefulness for how good your life is and the blessings in your life. Let me ask you some questions. How many of us this morning, we thank God for our car as we got up and drove here? I'll guarantee you, not, not having a go at anyone, most of us didn't, because we just take for granted. You know, there are people all around the world this morning getting up in other nations who are walking, walking through dirt and dust and heat just to get to a gathering like this. And we drove here in a car, probably with aircon on, listening to your favorite worship music, amen? People, you're blessed. We're blessed. We're blessed. And when things like that become normalized, we lose that sense of gratefulness. What about the house you woke up in this morning, the bed you were sleeping in? Who had a nice breakfast this morning? Right? We just, when, we, when we lose that sense of gratefulness for these things and we normalize them, then they just become a right, don't they? And we think, well, it's our right. But when we start thinking of things in terms of rights, we lose gratefulness for them. What about the opportunity to meet here? Just to be in a building gathered together. None of us are worried about guards running through that door right now with guns to shut us down. I mean, that's amazing. I've been in countries where that is a genuine fear. We've been to places uh, where, where you can't meet in public. Been to places where everybody gathers around on a dirt floor, cow manure floor, with one page of a Bible and a candle because they're so hungry and passionate about Jesus and they just want to get to know God through his son, Jesus Christ. It's amazing. We are so incredibly blessed. But when blessings become normalized, we lose our sense of gratefulness. And when blessings become normalized, we start to treat our blessings as if they were our rights. Now, how do you know that a blessing has become a right? Anyone ever seen the movie with the man? He comes home from work and the you know, wife, and I don't mean a gender stereotype here, don't get mad at me, I'm just... 
come home and their dinner's there, their nice dinner table and the can and everything, and he walks in, sits down and eats his meal. And, and, and then there's that scene later in the movie, he comes home and maybe the dinner's not there and he gets mad and angry. You ever seen those types of movies? Well, that's a man who's just thought that that blessing, is, that's just become a right. You, you think that's your right now to come home and have... And, it's, it's no longer, you're not grateful, it's no longer a blessing, you think that's your right now. I've got a, a friend of ours and they got married and um, he uh, was convinced that when they got married, he already had a picture of what life was going to be like. His wife was going to be, you know, like in the movies, the perfect woman and he was going to be the perfect man. And anyway, they, they got married and they uh, went to bed and woke up the first morning after their wedding night and he rolled over and looked into his beautiful wife's eyes and said, uh, would you mind getting me breakfast in bed, darling? And he said she burst into laughter at him. She looked him in the eyes and just burst into laughter. No way, Jose, you're getting breakfast in bed, mate. Later on that day, he needed to get a shirt ironed and he told me that he took the shirt over to her and asked her, would she iron it? He said she picked up the iron and actually threw the iron at me. So, you know, be grateful, men, for what you got, all right? Be grateful for what you got. Iron sharpens iron unless it's flying at your head. That's not what the Bible talks about. So how do you know that you've allowed a blessing to become a right? Well, here's a very simple way to do it. When the absence of that thing gets you more frustrated and angry, then the presence of that thing gets you grateful. Let me say that again. When the absence of that thing gets you more frustrated and angry, then the presence of that thing gets you grateful. If you find yourself in that position, guess what? You've now, it's no longer a blessing. Now you're treating that thing as a right. You're treating that thing as a right. And if you're treating that thing as a right, guess what? You won't be grateful for it. Because you'll live as if you deserve it. You'll live as if you deserve it. And the world around should cater to everything that you deserve. And how many of you know that's the world we live in, isn't it? We're full of rights. Everyone's got their rights. And the world's got to cater to our rights. Kids, I know we don't have kids church today, but kids, have a think about this. How many of you have thanked God today for your home? How many of you kids have have, have thanked God today for your mum and your dad? How many of you kids have thanked uh, God, today that you get the chance to go to school or that you're sitting here with clothing on when there's probably lots of children around that, that don't have that. Husbands, how many of you have come home to a clean house or found food in the cupboard and thanked the cupboard fairy? <laughs> oh, thank you, vacuum fairy, for cleaning the house today. Isn't that wonderful? And what have you been doing, Jackie? <laughs> Bang. You don't do that. Wives. How many of you have ever thanked your husband when he comes home from work? And again, I don't want to, don't gender stereotype me and get mad at me. Comes home from work and he's been shoveling or digging or whatever. And how many of you say, you know what, I'm, I'm really thankful. Thank you for going out and working hard, providing for our family today. And vice versa too. I know that we live in a world today where a lot of mothers have to go to work as well. Cost of living and all that stuff. How many of you husbands have ever uh, gotten past yourselves and said to your wives, you know, I really appreciate the fact that, of what you do for this family and keeping this family running and providing for us as well. How many of us have done that? See, when the absence of something gets you more frustrated or angry, then the presence of that thing gets you grateful. Then it's no longer a blessing, is it? It's become a right. And if you're going to be a person that lives focused on their rights, you will never, ever be a grateful person. And if you're never a grateful person, you will never be a generous person. You won't be. First Thessalonians 5.18, Paul writes this. He says, Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Notice he doesn't say give thanks in all circumstances because all circumstances are exactly what God wants for you. He's not saying that. What he's saying is giving thanks in all circumstances, that's the will of God. You might be going through circumstances right now that are not the will of God. He's not saying every circumstance you face is the will of God. What he's saying, though, is in the midst of whatever we're going through, continue to give thanks and be grateful to God. That's the will of God. In other words, the will of God is to live gratefully. It's to live gratefully. Ephesians 5.20, it says, Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. It sounds like a lifestyle to me, doesn't it? All circumstances for everything. That sounds like we're being told, live a life of gratitude. Live a life of gratitude. Live a life of gratefulness. And yes, we adopt that attitude of gratitude and it becomes the motivation for our generosity and our giving financially. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. Paul says, remember this to the Corinthian church. Remember this. Now, when someone says, remember this, they're also saying, don't forget. Yeah? He's saying, remember this. Why? He's saying, because you know what? This one is so easy to forget. 
Anyone forgetful? Anyone, anyone ever have, I know I do, my wife will say something to me, it's so crisp and so clear and so easy to interpret and understand and give me five seconds, I'll forget it. I'll forget it. And, and so Paul's saying here, hey, uh, remember this. In other words, don't forget what I'm about to tell you. And he says, whoever sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. Now, if you want to look at context, yes, Paul is talking about finances here. He is. He says, if you want to sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. But he says, whoever sows generously will reap generously. But then he says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, not being manipulated into it. For God loves a cheerful giver. God loves it. See, it's not just about giving. It's the attitude we give with too, isn't it? God's not just there going, this is a legal requirement and you just have to give. He's going, no, no, no. It's really important to me also how you give. I want you to give cheerfully. And I would say to everybody that calls a rise home, if you can't give with a good attitude, I would encourage you, keep your money. Don't give. Don't give until you can get with the Lord and go, okay, God, help me with my attitude here. Why is this a struggle? What's wrong with this? Because it's not just about the money and giving is not just about finance. It's about all the stuff that's attached to the human heart that God deals with and that God reveals. And those places that need healing and those places that need to be restored that are attached to money. He says that God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful uh, in the Greek, it's the word hilarious. It's where we get our word hilarious from. God loves a hilarious giver. In other words, God wants you to be excited about giving. Why does he want you to be excited about giving? Well, what did Paul just say? He said, I want you to remember this, that if you sow generously, you reap generously. Get excited about that. I want you to think about that when you give, that, what, that when you give, in other words, God gives back to you. I'm not saying cars, houses, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying though is whatever this is saying, it's saying something, right? And what he's saying is that the way that you sow, he said something's going to bounce back on your life. It just simply is because it's God. You ever heard people saying you can't outgive God? It's 100% true. You can't outgive God. And this is what he's saying. How do you be cheerful about your giving every time you give? You just remind yourself. Don't let yourself forget, hey, God, give, God loves cheerful givers and I'm cheerful because every time I give, I know that when I sow a uh, bountiful, I'm going to reap something back. God's going to bring something back into my world. It's just simply the way that it works. God wants our giving to come from a heart of gratitude. Let me finish up with this. I, 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 one of the things that people have said to me over the last five weeks is that even though we're talking about finances, it's so much broader than that. And I'm glad you said that because it is. It is. The Bible talks about the love of money being the root of all evil, doesn't it? It doesn't say money. It's money is a necessary thing. We need money. You need to pay your mortgage. You need to feed your kids. You need to educate your kids. You need, there's a bunch of things you need to do. And don't ever stand in a, a, a whether, I don't care whether it's a church or what, don't ever let anyone say to you, bring your wallet forward and empty it out here and just trust God. We're not talking about that. We've been talking about systematic giving. Have a system to your giving. We've been talking about voluntary giving. It's a voluntary thing. And now today we're talking about attitude, being grateful in your giving. You put those three things together and I think that's what God wants for the New Testament church when it comes to our giving. He wants it to be voluntary. He wants us to have a system. Because if you don't, I've got a system of, of my mortgage. X amount comes out from my mortgage every week. It's a system. X amount goes in the car for petrol. It's a system. I pay my school fees. It's a system. My electricity is paid. There's a system to everything else. Why not have a system to the way I give to the Lord? The way I contribute to the ministry of God through the church I'm a part of. And let me just finish with this. It's an old Peanuts cartoon. Anyone love Peanuts? I came across this Peanuts cartoon years ago, and here's what it says. In an old Peanuts cartoon, Lucy is demanding that her brother Linus change TV channels and then threatens him with her fists if he doesn't. Right? Any, anyone relate to that? Yeah, I thought so. What makes you think you can walk right in here and take over, asks Linus. These five fingers, said Lucy. Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit... They form a weapon that is terrible to behold. <laughs> what channel do you want, side Linus? <laughs> and turning away, he looks at his fingers and he says, why can't you guys get organised like that? <laughs> why can't you guys get organised like that? And I want to finish up our, our series on money and giving by just saying to you that part of what we're doing here is we're, we're saying, look, imagine what we could do if we were organised like that. See, one of the reasons why uh, it's good to give, and if you go to another church here, another gathering, I'm encouraging you, you should contribute financially to what's going on there. 
Because I'm sure that your pastor, uh, your leaders, whatever, I'm sure there's a vision and there are things they're a part of. People that give here uh, are a part of what we do here. Uh, we, we contribute to scripture in the schools. We contribute to overseas missions. Uh, we're contributing to sponsoring kids in Sri Lanka. And, every, and when I say we, I mean every individual that gives into this church. Every individual that sows money and gives into this place. Um, there's many, many things that churches do and that uh, I'm sure that your pastor does. And you know what? There's a lot more that we want to do as well. And I want to finish with this. And this is for those that are local, call this place home. There's a lot more that we want to do. There's a lot more that we want to do, but we can only do what we can do, amen? Yeah. Um, look around at the number of kids. You know, Sunday night, we're going to be meeting with about 14 to 17 young kids on Sunday night. We're doing a Bible study. You know what? I would love to be able to have a youth pastor here. Wouldn't it be great to, even if we just had enough finance to employ a youth pastor one day a week, what could that youth pastor do in reaching out to the kids, maybe getting into the schools? We're crying out for RE teachers in schools. Like, there's so much opportunity. We spent a whole life in YWAM in missions overseas, and we love missions. We have a heart for missions. But you know what? We were down South Lismore yesterday, and we had a bit of an outreach on this. Four churches we got together. We went to South Lismore. We were handing out food and had a jumping castle and all that sort of stuff going on and just blessing and loving on the people there. And you know what I realized? I had, I, we were called to India for years, and we did all sorts of stuff with YWAM. But you know what? This is a mission field where we live, amen? We live in a place that needs Jesus. And we want to do some things in our own backyard as well. We want to reach these people in this community. And you know what? The reality of the fact is this. Finances are an important part of that. And we talked about that. Even Jesus had a treasurer. Even Jesus needed finances to do the things that he did. He didn't just run around going, just going to rely on miracles because God wants us to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. He wants us to sow into something called the kingdom of God so that people get to hear the Jesus story because we live in a time and a season and a place where the Jesus story is being erased. And if the church doesn't take that call seriously... Give it a generation and let's see what this nation looks like. Give it a generation and let's see. We look at the younger generation now and we see the hopelessness amongst them. Wait till they don't have a chance to even hear the Jesus story if we ever get to that place. 19 years of age, I found hope in the Jesus story. And I'm here today because of that hope. And if I didn't find Jesus, I actually don't know whether I'd be here. And there's probably other people like that here. So Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for uh, this place. God, I want to thank you for the people in this place. Lord, we've covered a lot of ground. In the last five weeks, uh, Lord, I know that, uh, uh, God, people have heard our heart. God, we've looked at these collection of ancient documents to make sure it's all biblical. But Lord, I just want to pray uh, right now, God, for those who are still thinking, umming and ahhing. Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you speak to their hearts? Would you speak to them, God, about this area of generosity? Would you speak to them about this area of giving, Father? And Lord, thank you for your spirit and thank you for the opportunity that we have to make a difference. God, in this tiny drop in the bucket amount of years that we have here on planet Earth, Lord. God, I pray that each person would have a passion and a heart, God, to want to be a part of something way bigger than themselves. They'd want to leave their mark here on planet Earth for the kingdom of God. So one day when we get there, Father, we'll have people bumping into us going, I'm here because you gave. I'm here because you prayed. I'm here because you told me about Jesus. I'm here because you loved on me. I'm here because you bought me a shirt. I'm here because of whatever. And we would have known that we played a part in seeing people come to faith. And Father, in the next seven days as we leave this place, I pray for each of us, give us an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. God, somebody out there that doesn't know about the goodness of God, doesn't know that you love them and doesn't know what you did for them 2,000 years ago on that cross, give us a chance to tell them about it in the next seven days. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Wow, that's awesome. Five weeks talking about money in church and you're still coming back. That's a miracle in itself. Thank you, Jesus. 